It's good to be here with you today and with Kathy Borey. She's an author, a speaker, creative writer, and tireless advocate for those with Alzheimer's and their caregivers. She is a law school graduate and she has a master's degree in public health. On a fancier note, she is an accomplished ballroom dancer who has a deep love for clowning and theater. Much of this helped her through her journey with her mother who had Alzheimer's. More than 70,000 British Columbians and are currently living with Alzheimer's uh, or some form of dementia, and that is a lot. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. yep. Interesting title, the long hello rather than the long goodbye. Yes, an important title because it says an entirely different message. Uh, you hear the long goodbye, you hear that stated all the time, you hear things like the endless dying, the endless forgetting, the empty shell, and I thought those are disrespectful words and they're not uh, entirely true. Although there are components of the disease that are heartbreaking, as there are for any chronic disease, I, I learned it at my mother's side that it was something I was going to do was say hello to every phase of her illness and not goodbye. It's a very different perspective. Mm -hmm. A big hello. Yes, a big hello. Yes. Uh, how did you find out your mother had Alzheimer's? I try to remember that. It's so foggy now, but it, things happen over time gradually with that disease. And you're sort of thinking, well, that's a little bit odd, and that's a bit odd. And then it becomes a little more cumulative. And we ended up going to the doctor with some of her symptoms, and then she had that uh, diagnosis. Well, how did she react? Um, to tell you the truth, what she, th she also had Parkinson's, so there is a comp component of dementia with Parkinson's, and mm. so she really thought that the changes in her mind were because of that, and um, we made a decision just not to expand on that, so she was very, very upset, didn't want to be a burden, but you know, she had, she had sort of trooper blood in her, so she just took one day at a time. Take me back to her beginnings. Her trooper blood beginnings. Right. Well, she was born in Winnipeg uh, from uh, an Irish dad and an English mom. They came out to BC when she was three and lived in Vancouver, grew up in Vancouver with a brother and a sister. And her, her sister's still alive at 97, although mm. she wouldn't want me to say that. <laughs> and um, so she grew up here and worked uh, for the Board of Trade doing secretarial work and then married and had her family and on it went. She married a first time and a second time. She did, yes. What happened the first time? First time, um, this was in the 50s when nobody got divorced and uh, my dad had a drinking problem that was becoming more and more severe and she was worried about the safety of her two children and decided to move back in with her parents, which I think was very hard to do in those days. Mm -hmm. And it's something you revisited with her yes. during her journey. Right. What happened was as she started to go back in time, Fanny, in, in memory, I, I sort of thought, oh, I started to go back in time as well. And I would tap into my stories uh, as well as her tapping into hers. And what I really enjoyed about that, it was a, a, an, a, an opportunity to revisit difficult times, but also wonderful times. And they, those stories sort of formed the context for our caregiving relationship. So instead of just a book about Alzheimer's and caregiving, the stories mm -hmm. that we had both lived provided a context into which those caregiving li lives sort of made sense. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, the tough times and the happy times. Yeah. And uh, one of the tough times was when she uh, left your father yes. in the middle of the night. Yes, yes. Put Terrible. you kids in the car. How right. did it work? You had, had a brother, Hugh. Uh, yeah, he was three years older than I, and I was, um, I think I was six. I must have been six. And we didn't know what was going on, of course, and felt terrible about leaving and frightened. And as um, somebody had said in one of my blurbs, that, you know, it's a wasp upbringing. You don't, it's this code of silence. Mm -hmm. And that's tricky. Yes, the doily life. That's right. Yes, the yeah. neighbors think everything is perfect. Right at that house. That's right. And if you live in that house, <laughs> you know <laughs> everything is not perfect. That's right. Especially in the 50s and the 60s. Yes. Perhaps we're a little more honest today. Mm -hmm. I think so. Not sure. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. so, so take me on the journey. Mother remarries. She remarried when I was 13 to a man that she'd known for many, many years who was very active in the business community here. And uh, he was traveled a lot, Vancouver Board of Trade, Commerce. And she, he was older than her by 23 years. And um, they, they were a good fit, I think. He, he was uh, busy and active, but she also wanted to have a home again. And so they married. And I went to boarding school because he traveled a lot. And um, I think he'd already had his family. And I, I don't think it would have worked very well to have a child at home. 
I see, and so the mother said, I love you and I'll marry you and you have, it. did she ever talk about it uh, when she was sick? No. No. Um, not really, not mm. really, not that, I don't recall that aspect. We talked about it as, as I was growing up because I didn't, I didn't enjoy boarding school. I didn't want to go to boarding school and be 20 minutes from my home and not get to go home because we only got to go home once a, once a week during the day. But it was when I was older that I came to understand that sometimes you get the life that's actually the one you're supposed to be living and that if I'd moved back home, I think it would have been disastrous and I don't think she was expecting that I would be off to boarding school, neither was I, but in the end, Maybe it was mm. just the way it had to be. Well, it, it was an issue for you, and some issues you never quite resolved. Right. No, it was. It was. I was not happy there. Most mm. of us, most boarders weren't. Well, especially if you lived in the city right. where you and had to board, yeah. so you couldn't go home, right. and you had to go to church, and you That's had to right. do all of that. Yeah. It was very strict in those days. It wasn't uh, any leniency. If you did something wrong, you didn't get to go home mm. that week. So it wasn't, uh, wasn't what we think of as the English boarding schools. Everybody's having a lot of fun. Exactly. But I also, in reminiscing, found look back at all the good things and the good friends I made mm -hmm. and the sports I was able to do and the leadership positions I was able to take. Maybe I wouldn't have had those. Well, and the contacts you make. Right. That too. Yes. Yeah. Uh, did your mom come to all the events, the sporting events? She was a participating mother? In, as, in those days, they didn't really do it like they do now. Like th There were sports days and things like that that people came to, but mm -hmm. everything else we did, you know, there wasn't a huge lineup of parents at the sides of the grass hockey fields and in the, in the gyms. She just didn't do that in those days, not as much. But mm -hmm. anything that was going on, definitely she would have been yes. there. Now, your brother Hugh. Yes. He, he was killed. Yes. What happened? Well, um, it's a, it's a, it takes up a whole chapter in the book, as you know. Mm -hmm. And um, he was 13, and he was coming home from the beach one day, and there were some older boys that were drunk and driving around uh, picking fights with people and tried to sort of push them off the road and started a fight with you know these much younger boys. These guys were 18, and fought, beat him up, and he died. It's just, just exactly mm -hmm. how it happened. Not an accident. No. How did your mother talk about it? Well, again, it was that WASP thing. You know, the whole thing about grieving and dying these days, it's support groups and lots of, lots mm -hmm. of people. It's all open. But in those days, um, you know, I was told by even neighbors that I shouldn't bring that subject up because it was too painful. So uh, really, it didn't get talked about. How about when she was sick? This was a huge blessing, Fanny, because one day she asked me um, what happened to Hugh, that she didn't remember how he died, and of course I just froze, t terrified, and then I thought, okay, well he died in an accident, Mom. Oh, mm -hmm. and yes, he died very peacefully, and that was it. She never mentioned him again, which I thought was a huge blessing. And did you find sometimes you had to do what my father used to call selective truth-telling with your mom during the seven years? Yes, lots of times. It became a fiction. I loved it. Lucky you're good at drama. Yeah. Good. Well, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I became better at it. But the, the, it's a whole thing of accepting where a person is and following them. And I, I remember one day she wanted to know where her mother was, which was always heartbreaking. And I, the first time I told her the truth, thinking I should do that. Well, she was devastated. And then I amended that story so that they were out shopping, and uh, or they, uh, she had a cold and couldn't make it that day. And you know, it worked. Did she tell you things that you had no idea about? During the seven years, uh, uh, things that surprised you, shocked you about her early life, her middle life, her relationship with your father? I don't think it was so much stories like that because we'd had, I knew her quite well. We'd had so many conversations, mm. right? And of course, I taped our conversations when she was ill. I think what took me by surprise was this emergence of this poet voice in her. Uh, she was very funny and very um, insightful but also po very poetic. And that small book, of course, is dedicated to her. Mm -hmm. It's all her words. So she said things mm -hmm. that were astonishingly beautiful. Like? Well, one day I went over to her and I said, well, you know, how are you, Mom? And she didn't recognize me that day. So she said, well, Kathy was over here today. And I said, oh, really? And she said, yes. Kathy was over here and she said to me, Mom, I'm not going to offer to give them my shadow. And I said, really? Where was this? And she said, somewhere on the other side of here. So beautiful things mm. like that. And uh, I thought that was wonderful. And is she the one who said, and I suspect she did, that she still talks to God because he's good company? Yes. <laughs> when did you 
decide to record this and why? We were, we were at a restaurant in Park Royal where we went all the time trying mm -hmm. to fill our days. And I had, you're going to find this impossible to believe, but I had just been dumped by this young man, or not so young, I guess. Yes. And my I can't believe anybody would dump you. <laughs> I mean, really. Numerous times. But anyway, um, I... Uh, More than you can count. <laughs> perhaps. Okay. That's another show. All right. And um, she, uh, I, and I was devastated and depressed, and I wanted to ask her opinion about things because I always appreciated her counsel but I thought because her mind is changing maybe I can't do this but mm -hmm. I, I thought what the heck mm -hmm. I said mom what do you do if you love somebody but he doesn't love you without skipping a beat she says go find someone else <laughs> which was very funny I if thought, he's well, not in he's in the way it's a great idea yes. So then I thought well I'm gonna keep going so I said well why do people marry well for two reasons first they want to fill up their boots and they want to keep going and they really don't care where then I said, well, what is love? Mm -hmm. Love is the sublime between two people in the same working order. I scratched these down with coffee-stained napkins and decided at that point, these mm -hmm. are words worth recording. Yes. So that's what I did after that. I recorded many of her conversations, which I still have live, and which the book is you know, full of all her quotations, and our performances are all her voice. Mm -hmm. So. It was a great idea. Tell me about the performance you did at the church recently. Oh gosh, it was a dream come true. I first launched these books and did a performance with a, a local actor here, Malia McClure, at MoMA in New York City. And after that, I kept wanting to build on it. So mm. this was a concert, uh, was a fundraiser for their seniors programs. And Patty Allen, who's an award-winning actor in town, read my mum's voice. Ariel Barnes, who's principal cellist for the Vancouver Opera, played mm -hmm. in between all our texts. And the Marcus Mosley uh, Chorale, of course, famous gospel choir, 55, yes. opened and closed for us, singing Beatles songs, Amazing. Let It Be, and Hello, Goodbye. We, it was just absolutely beautiful. And it's a theatrical reading, so we read, but theatrically. And it's geared to anyone, I suspect, not just somebody who's dealing with uh, people who have dementia or Alzheimer's or chronic disease. Right. We, it's, for any human yes. who's interested in theater, I think so. We we amend the profound moments. Yes, we we amend the performance depending on who the audience is, but it's for people with dementia or worrying about it, which is everybody, or people, as you say, with chronic disease or the mother-daughter relationship is very interesting to people. We're going to expand on this and add more of the background stories and uh, maybe an orchestra or two if I can find somebody who wants to do mm. that. Mm. So we want, just want to make it bigger and bigger. And what's funny about it? What's humorous about it? Well, her, the dialogue. Uh, one day, Mom was looking around the room, and I said, is there anybody in the room with us right now? When I finally realized I should go with the flow and follow. She said, yes. I said, well, should I ask them to leave? And she said, oh, no, they'll leave soon. And she said, you know, there were all these men around earlier. And I said, really? And she said, yes. I said, well, do you like having men around? Well, yes, I do. Well, why is that? Well, they look awfully nice in their jockey shorts. <laughs> I didn't see. Even know. I didn't even know. Who no, knew? she knew people were. Anyway, did, uh, well, the we, old days, right? Yes, or you asked, you say, did he wear jockeys or did he wear boxers? <laughs> mm -hmm. And how do you know, mother? Know. It was hysterical. How difficult was it for you to be able to embrace her with laughter and to not correct her? to let her flow. Well, when I corrected her, um, when I, before I really knew better, uh, it's very tempting to correct, you know, it's very tempting yeah. to get it right the way you want them to be. And we had driven by a shopper's drug mart and she said, oh, look at that lovely new store. And I said, well, that's not new, that's been there for years, thinking it was my job to correct her, reorient her. Well, she, she was crestfallen. So after that, I tried to get on the bandwagon of just following. Right. Oh yes, that's a new store, good idea and going along with it. Interesting. I wasn't always successful, I'm not going to pretend I was, but when right. I was, life is a lot better Yes, for everybody. And your mother had a deep love of the sea. She did. And of fishing. She did. When we come back, we'll talk about that. Okay. Okay. We'll return with Kathy Borey and her insightful reflections on family and on living with Alzheimer's disease.